right, welcome to God Manifest. That was an awesome set. And we love worship. And that was an awesome set. Olivia, Olivia checked that out yesterday, and we listened to it and worshiped to it yesterday. And, and um, it's just as powerful today as it was yesterday. Um, it's time for offerings. And whatever you all give today, we're going we're gonna to turn around and bless our speakers. Uh, well, we always add more on top of what y'all give, so um, we know you're going to be blessed today. This is an awesome day. We have two amazing people here. Mo, we just met. Um, he's a prophet, and he, he, he walks in the office of a prophet, and he just, he just carries a special anointing. And I, um, during worship today, I saw a long hallway that was covered in cobwebs. It was layer after layer after layer but I saw a beautiful thing stuck on it. What God was showing me was, God said, hey, those things are stuck were promises that were released to your church, released to your people, released to those who are watching online and those who are here. And the enemy has been capturing these promises. So spiritually, I started breaking down these cobwebs one after the other, and God says, why tear them down by your hands if you can call down the flames of God to tear them all down now? And so in Jesus' name, I just release the flames of heaven to burn down every cobweb and then release every promise back into the lives and the hearts and in, even into the, the, the bank accounts and finances of everyone here. I know some of us here have been struck financially. Some of us here have been struck emotionally. Some of our families have been attacked. Uh, we know this because we're the pastors. A lot of us, a lot of people have opened up to us and I'm telling you today, there's a breakthrough. Those cobwebs, those promises that God made to you years and years ago are coming to fruition today. There's something beautiful and something special. Olivia, can you turn down the main volume? There's two switches. Down more. Okay, that's better. Um, What God showed me was as, as these cobwebs were started to burn down that old empty hallway that was, that was covered in soot, everything started to become new. So God's also re releasing a renewing into your spirits, a, re a release of hope. I just kept on hearing hope. And, you know, Olivia and I need more hope. We all need more hope, more joy, more of the things of God. And there is a, there's an anointing on hope today. So those areas in your life, that you've, you've looked at and said, man, these things are, seem hopeless now. I can't find hope in this situation I'm in. Well, I'm telling you, God, who has those promises begin to land back into your heart and it becomes to come alive. Hope is going to begin to rise and you're going to begin to overcome. And not by your strength, but God's faithfulness. It's how beautiful, how beautiful a God that we have that has, that has died so that we can be free. So without further ado, if you all want to give today, just ask God what, what, what's, whatever he puts on your heart. Just, you can make the check out that God manifests or cash, and we'll take the full amount again, and we'll bless our speakers. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Larry Taylor up. Larry Taylor is a man who has traveled, literally traveled the world and spoken at, at conferences and, and has done mission trips and, and, and uh, revivals all over the world. Last night, we were just sitting there chatting um, talking about miracles and the things that he's seen and, and some of the things that we've been excited about. And, and, uh, and Olivia and I, I think at the end of the night, we said, man, we've only seen like 1% of what Larry has seen in, this, in our life. And we thought we'd seen some awesome miracles. So you all are in for an amazing treat. Um, really, just position your heart in a position to receive. And I think that's the beauty of, of, of Christ. We receive. And so as God begins to pour out of these two gentlemen, Put your heart in a position to receive. Because I believe God is, God is going to do something amazing today. In your lives, in your situation. I know some of us are, are potentially looking at career moves. And, and I bet God's going to open up clarity on if you should move, when you should move, and where, should, where you should go. There are, there are going to be signs that are going to point you in a direction where you're supposed to go. And sometimes that's all you need is an arrow and just say yes and run. Um, I, was, I was once accused of having uh, of, uh, foolish faith 
And the person who said it said it, I was as negative, and then paused and said, God said he loves it. God says, you're the guy that says, go left, and you just turn and run. And he goes, God can use that. And I'm telling you now that God can use it. When you, when you run towards something for God, God will use it. So, Larry Taylor, thank you very much for being here. He's like a father of this, of this house. Wow, wow. Oh, praise God. That was awesome, wasn't it? I don't want to quit. I was like, let's stay there a while. <laughs> um, yeah, you've got an amazing worship team here. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> really blessed. They look familiar. I mean, they look, yeah. <laughs> Lord, I just ask you to have your way this morning. Uh, it's no accident we're here, and, and you've planned this, and you've orchestrated it, and you've put a, a sense of purpose for both Mo and I to be here um, in spite of circumstances. And so, Lord, I just thank you that you've got a divine appointment for some folks this morning to have a meeting with your Holy Spirit that just uh, uh, undoes what needs to be undone and fixes what needs to be fixed. <laughs> Yeah, y'all can laugh now. Uh, uh, <laughs> but so it's going to be good. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Yeah, my friend Mo uh, Sanders, um, we've known each other for years. He lives in Lubbock. He felt really specifically that he was to come on this trip. So I'm really, I mean, he's, I'm just glad he's here. It's a long drive. How many of you have been to Lubbock? And uh, <laughs> how many of you know where Lubbock is? <laughs> how many of you? It's on the map. Yeah, and uh, I live in a little town called Graham, which I'm sure nobody knows where that is except for Jonathan and, and uh, Olivia. It's good to see the yackles here, Sue and Ray. God bless you guys, like road warriors, for real. <laughs> You've been on the journey, right? Started in a similar place. That sounds a little like I'm echoing unnecessarily to me. It may not to you all, but. Sounds like it's echoing a little bit unnecessarily there. Um, yeah, well, Jonathan, I, I want to start with this. My name's Larry Taylor. How's that? Um, this is kind of an interesting trip for me. I wasn't expecting what happened to me on this trip because um, I suddenly realized I kind of knew I was going to be in the area that I grew up in. I didn't realize I was actually going to be on the streets that I used to ride my bicycle on. <laughs> um, I, I grew up uh, about three years of my life, lived over on Dunlap Street over off Hillcroft uh, when I was uh, right before junior high, you know. Uh, and then we moved back to my hometown, which is Groveton, Texas, up in, uh, you know, the backyard of Houston, East Texas. And, um, yeah, so this was like a weird experience for me, uh, just driving around the streets that I remember when I was a little kid, only they moved everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's not there anymore. My, the, my house is gone. <laughs> It's replaced with another old house. How could they have, I mean, the one I lived in was new when I lived in it, and they've obviously replaced it with another one. It's old now. Yeah, Mo, we're old. We're, we're old. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's great. It's great to be here. I'm excited about it. I'm really excited because God began speaking to me really strongly during worship, some things he wanted to say to you guys, and a realization that for some of you, this is going to be a life-changing experience today. I know Mo is bringing some revel uh, revelatory stuff that's really going to help, um, and he'll even show you how to release it in a minute. But uh, <laughs> and Mo, you got freedom just to jump in wherever you feel like you need to. Um, I'll probably get you at the end there or the next phase two. Um, I had a word though for for you guys this morning first, uh, Olivia. And, and Jonathan, I, I wasn't going to say it. They, they've been up to our place in Graham. I'm a pastor in Graham now. I haven't always been a pastor. Um, don't know how much of my history would be helpful for you to know, but just enough for you to feel like the guy at least has preached before. Um, but I, I, I was saved when I was 17. I got in the Jesus movement right off the bat in Houston, Texas. Uh, I, I worked as a summer intern for First Baptist Church in Houston, traveling around. Is anybody a native Houstonian? All right, how many of you were alive in the 70s? <laughs> okay, so uh, there was a real move of God in the 70s all over America, and it hit Houston, uh, hit a lot of places in Houston, but one of the big places it hit was First Baptist Church, ironically. And um, 
a guy named Richard Hogue had meetings and we actually did a tent. We went around the city with a tent, putting up our tent in different neighborhoods in Houston on vacant lots uh, with a team and, and we'd preach and, and speak, see people get saved and get baptized and all the drug guys in Montrose put, hit, uh, put out a contract on us and it was a fun time. It was really... <laughs> <laughs> Where was I going? Oh, I did that. Yeah, that was 17. And then when I was 17, um, but I, I, my background was Southern Baptist. I went, you know, I was educated Southern Baptist, but something happened to me. I, I met the Holy Ghost and uh, sort of changed my whole, you know, thing. And it's been a journey. It's been exciting. Uh, but I pastored for 13 years and then I traveled for 20 as an itinerant ministry, uh, you know, just traveling around. And then uh, at the end of that 20-year period, it's like the Lord said, okay, I want you to pastor again. I said, no way, Jose. How many of you know you don't tell God what to do? <laughs> so now I'm pastoring again in a church in Graham, Texas, and it's going great. We've been there four years. It's awesome. A lot of people are feeling connected to us, and that's good. I didn't know that was going to happen. It's kind of surprising me, so I'm having to adjust to it. But um, I know these guys were blessed coming up and really connected. I know you guys have had Rob Perkle here, who's one of our spiritual sons, I guess, that he likes to be called that. And um, <laughs> Hi, Rob. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, then, uh, yeah, and then the whole team that came down with him, uh, you know, the, the My uh, Myers and uh, the Nails. Who else was on that? That was the other one at Nails and Myers. and um, the, the Odoms? The Odoms were? Sherry. Sherry. Yeah, Sherry Nail. Sherry yeah, Sherry. right. So they're all from our church. I mean, and we've got an amazing group of people. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's just been fun to watch. Hey, Rob is one. He isn't? He is. He is. Well, of course he is. He's, requi <laughs> he's required to. <laughs> but <laughs> so, and then Jonathan and, and Olivia came up to our place, what, three times now, I guess you've been up? And um, so I feel a connection. I feel like it's okay for me to say this yeah. to you guys right now, but I got a word uh, during worship. And, and <laughs> this comes from a scripture and I'm going to have to explain it, okay? But it says, um, it's, it's in Jeremiah 12, 5, if you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how you, can you compete with horses? <laughs> if you stumble in a peaceful land, how will you do in the thickets of the Jordan? Uh, that's a really interesting translation. How many of y'all have ever heard that scripture before? If you run, if you stumble with a footman, how are you going to run with the horses? Um, here's the idea is that everything that's happening for you guys now, and this is for everybody, I think, but especially for you, everything that's going on in your life, and for all of us, really, it, it, it's, it's a, a learning ground for what God's preparing you for, which is always greater and more. Amen. And so the challenges and the experiences you're having now, you're learning to run with footmen because you're going to be running with horses. And so don't see your challenges as negatives and you know, roadblocks or obstacles to God's will for your life. They're actually just like David. It's the lions you get to kill that teaches you how to kill Goliath. Okay? What you learn in the small setting will be the thing that God uses you as things grow and the principles that you establish now are going to be for the rest of your ministry life. Does that make sense? Good. So far, so good. Hey, that's a great scripture. I don't know. Why it doesn't get quoted more. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> we got folks from Thailand. Where, where else are people watching this morning? Thailand and where else? Just everywhere. How many of y'all were in Rob's meetings when he was here? Okay. How many of you were not in Rob's meetings when he was here? How many of you are not going to raise your hand no matter what question I ask? Uh, yeah, well, Rob's a special friend, and they are really, we need to pray for them right now. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we just release the miraculous power and provision of God over Rob and his house and the team you're raising up there and what you're doing in Thailand and Myanmar through the amazing ministry of the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for David and the kids, how you're touching them. Lord, let that glory, let that glory spread. <laughs> Lord, touch all of Thailand, touch all of Myanmar. And today, just release hope. Tonight, just release hope in Rob and Nusera and the whole team for the greater things that are ahead, the greater things that are ahead in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I love Rob. He's a great guy. He <laughs> uh, let's, uh, 
I got a couple of scriptures I want to start with, and I, I, I don't usually have notes, but I do today. That's going to be interesting because I don't usually do that. But I didn't want to forget some of the things the Lord really put on my heart to say to you guys today. Um, how many of you know God's always doing a new thing? How many of you have adapted your mindset to that reality? What I mean by that, how many of you have adapted your mindset to the reality that God is always doing a new thing? Because that means if God is always doing a new thing, you will be too if you're following him. And that requires a real change in the mindset most people have about life. We like to get our track set, established, and we're going to run on it no matter what. And, you know, we just see things through that lens. If you understand about the Holy Spirit especially, it, the Bible says the wind blows where it will, you know. It's going to go where it wants to. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going. So are those who are born of the Spirit. That's in John, matter of fact. Uh, and if you want to look it up. But there's a necessity if we're going to walk in the Spirit and be led by the Spirit and flow in the reality that God wants to establish in our lives, then it's going to require extreme flexibility. <laughs> Everybody say yes. Uh, and that doesn't mean God is unstable. <laughs> it means he's continually doing a new thing. And because I have been around for centuries now, <laughs> two, I've been in two centuries, um, <laughs> a millennium, I've covered a whole yeah, new millennium. Um, because of the, you know, the time I got in the charismatic movement till today, I've seen lots of things happen, lots of trends, lots of new things emerge. And there's kind of a continual undercurrent of criticism about that because people always want things to be the same. You know, like these guys are flighty or these guys. No, it's the reality that we live in that the Spirit of God moves in ever creative ways. We have a creative Father. He's really creative. And so to try to limit him to human understanding and our plans is really putting on him something that he's not because he's infinitely creative. And he renews his promises and he renews his um, purpose in every generation and even within a generation he will kind of do whole new things some people get discouraged in their lives when there's a job change for instance you guys were talking about job changes a moment ago because we want to get a career and we'll stay in that career for a lifetime and get a good retirement that hardly happens to anybody anymore I mean even set God aside in, in a culture that we live in now it is rare for anybody to have a lifetime career in one particular job or one location. So there's this need, I think, in the body of Christ for us to adapt and adopt a mentality of flexibility because God is doing a new thing. Right now, God's doing a new thing. <laughs> Y'all don't seem too excited about that yet. <laughs> um, I was in a, invited to do a meeting up in New England back in the fall. It was a big conference they had. Uh, and it was at the, uh, the, the site for the conference was the Moody College that Dwight L. Moody established uh, in the earlier, you know, earlier years in his life and ministry. I don't know if you all even know who he is, but he's a really famous evangelical evangelist, kind of like pre-Billy Graham. He was a couple of generations before Billy Graham. And he led a movement that, that you know, like, mil, I think it was a million, I forgot how many it was, a, a million evangelists signed up to go overseas uh, under his ministry, students. Um, and so this was a meeting that was designed to kind of commemorate him and talk about what God's doing now. And I think, you know, Chuck Pierce was there, Heidi Baker was there. There was a lot of, you know, well-known folks there. It was a really big meeting, significant for New England. But in that meeting, what I realized the whole meeting was about was this new thing that God's doing. <laughs> And he's raising up a whole new generation of evangelists. Hmm, I can tell you, I'm really excited about that. Um, <laughs> how many of you were around and remember when God began to move uh, to establish the prophetic uh, as, a, as a fresh thing in the, in the 1980s? How many of you remember the 1980s? <laughs> Mike Bickle, Rick Joyner, you know those names? Okay. There was a move of God back in the 80s that those men were a part of. It was Kansas City Fellowship. It was the name of the church back then. It later became IHOP. They wrote a book about that season. It's called Some Said It Thundered. Uh, but it was a generation. It was a, it was a fresh thing God was doing 
for all of us, Mo and I were touched by that move, where God was reestablishing the prophetic in a fresh new way that really had not been experienced in the body of Christ before. It was a fresh new thing, and there was an embracing of it so that now it's really common. I mean, you know, uh, the Bethels, uh, Dan McCollum, Bethel, Sean Bolts, all those guys uh, have a, a heritage and a roots in that move because it was a fresh new thing. But how many, most of you were not around, but it was not easy to embrace in those days. There was a lot of, it was messy. It was not neat. Not everybody knew what they were doing. They just knew we were going after prophecy. And, you know, it, it, it happened. God just did it. But the body of Christ had to adjust to this new thing and receive that gift and receive it, make room for it. Hello. How many of y'all make room for the prophetic in your lives? How many of you do that? It's a priority for me to make room for the prophetic. You know, God speaks through his prophets. He reveals himself through his prophets. And so if you're going to run with the <laughs> horses, you have to hear a clear word. And so that's why I really almost insist on having prophetic people with me when I minister because I think it's absolutely necessary to get the whole counsel of God, you know. Uh, but something God showed me up in uh, New England, you know, back in the fall was this, is that the thing that God's doing now is he's raising up a whole new generation of evangelists. And not after the patterns of the evangelists we've had in the past. Uh, they're not dependent on a presentation in a booklet, and, and they're not the fiery guy, um, you know, with a slick back hair and a, a really loud tie. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Prophets can say that, I won't say. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but they're, they're, and, and it's a new generation. It's a young generation. Most of them are young, at least under 40. But you know, the, the calling cards are signs and wonders and miracles as a tool for leading people to Jesus. And it's people that are just radically for, for Jesus and listening to and following the Holy Spirit, being led by God to do evangelism, not just doing insurance sales for Jesus. You know, not just cornering people and trying to talk them into Jesus, but leading people into an encounter with Jesus that really transforms their lives. And so he's raising that up right now, and it's brand new, and it's happening in Europe. It's happening uh, in Australia and America, but it's kind of the new thing. And not everybody realizes what's happening, first of all, and not everybody's really comfortable with some of the things that are happening because it's outside the walls. It's not primarily happening inside of buildings. It's not happening in an organized fashion sometimes. Now, sometimes it is. Sometimes we're doing meetings and crusades. Uh, some of you guys know Ben and Jody Hughes. Uh, by the way, pray for Jody. She's recovering, uh, but she just needs our prayers while she's recovering from surgery. Um, but Ben and Jody Hughes were part of a group that met in Europe a few months ago, and these are young evangelists, and I was so excited about this group. I've talked about them everywhere I go because they were having a seminar on how to do evangelism. But their seminar was not on, you know, how to present the four spiritual laws or how to, how to you know, how to get. Their, their seminar was on how to rent stadiums and negotiate contracts for soccer stadiums in Europe and how to get sound systems for thousands of people. And Ben had just been, excuse me, Ben, if you're listening, I'm going to use your stories. But Ben had just been over in, in Africa where he was in Reinhardt Bonnke's final crusade. You know, they had a big final crusade, like a million people over a series of nights. And so Ben goes into one of these soccer stadiums that they're looking to rent in Europe, and he looks at it, and it only holds 40,000 people, I think, or something like that. And he says, this is too small. Now listen, for our generation to go into an empty soccer stadium of that size and say, this is too small, that's a different mindset. But if you've seen a million in an open field, it is. You know what I'm saying? And so some of that's perspective. He's raising up a generation of guys that see with that perspective. We're going to fill up this stadium. We're going to do signs and wonders and miracles. We're going to do worship. We're going to have prophetic ministry. We're going to have healing. It's, it's a part of the package, but it's a new thing. Are you all catching what I'm saying? And so what I felt like for many years in my life, one of the main things that I focus on is sensing what God is doing in the moment and getting in on that. And trying to instead of trying to tell God what he needs to do in my life for me, I find out what he's doing and I join in with that. Does that communicate to any of you? Yes. In other words, if you really want to see the move of God and you really want his destiny for your life and his purposes fulfilled, then don't try to talk him into your plan. That's right. Find out what his plan is and get on it. And I think a lot of Christians spend most of their lives frustrated 
because they have a plan and they're trying to talk God into blessing it and God's saying, that's not my plan. And there is a limited blessing just because you're a Christian. Some good things are going to happen to you, but it's not the full release and the full measure of what you know in your heart he's really called you to. So aligning yourself with his purpose is really, really a part of the mindset of being flexible. And, a, and I don't know of a better example in the whole world that I've ever met than Rob Perkle now. <laughs> I hate to use Rob for an example on everything, but I've never met a guy that is so flexible. Like, like if he says go tomorrow, he's gone. You know, where's Rob? He's just left last night. I don't know where he went. He's gone. But there is that element that is necessary if we're going to really continue to function and flow in the spirit. And when you get to be my age, I don't mind revealing my age. I'm really old. <laughs> and if uh, I don't pretend I'm not. I probably talk about it too much. But uh, when you get to be my age, there is a tendency to say, okay, I have changed enough for one lifetime. <laughs> right? I've, I've been through, and I'm just going to settle in and settle down here. <laughs> it doesn't, well, you can do it. And you see people all around you doing it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But you also see them spiritually atrophying, atrophying, yeah, right. and, and no longer being fruitful. There was a, yeah, so flexibility, all right? So I believe God's doing a new thing, and I think part of the identity of what you guys are going to walk out is seeing how you fit in the flow of that in Houston, Texas. I love Houston, Texas. Now, that's a big thing for me to say uh, because I haven't been here in years, and I really wrote it off, to be honest with you. And I was asking the Lord, why in the world at this point in my life am I back in Houston, Texas? And he's just birthing a love in me for this place again. Because it is a city that's dynamic. It's a city that's diverse. It's a city that impacts the world. Um, I was here back in the 60s when the Astros started, when they built the Astrodome. Uh, you know, and was, uh, Andre Previn was the director of the Houston Symphony Orchestra. And, I mean, there was just Love You Blue was the thing, right? You know, the Houston Oilers, uh, Bum Phillips. It was, it was the heyday. Of, you know, NASA, I mean, all the astronauts who were superstars in those days. They lived in Friendswood. I mean, it, this was the place it was all happening. What's that? No, my friends lived in Friendswood. No. <laughs> yeah, Clear Lake and Friendswood, yeah. Um, that area. Yeah, so anyway, um, what am I saying? God loves Houston. He loves Houston, Texas. And there's a spiritual destiny on this city. And if we can overcome the tendency to divide up into camps and compete with one another, great things are going to happen in this city again. Amen. Great things are happening. I mean, I, I bless Joel Osteen. I bless what God's doing in that church. Uh, we have relatives. That's their church, and they don't even, they've never even been to Houston. <laughs> um, but they're touching the world. You know, I bless what God's already doing in Houston, but he's got more, all right? 2 Timothy 4, 7. I want to read something out of the Bible because um, I think that's important. It's not an official church service if the minister doesn't read from the Bible, right? Second Timothy 4, 17. This is Paul's summary of his ministry. Um, kind of interesting. He's writing to Timothy. He says, but, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be f preached fully through me. And that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered from the mouth of the lion. Hmm. Uh, there, was a, there was a sense that Paul had as he was writing to Timothy, his spiritual son. And he's saying to Timothy, I have done my assignment. My assignment was to fully preach the gospel. And I was given a specific group of people to do that to, the Gentiles. And I have fully preached that message to the Gentiles by the help of the Lord. How many of you would like to be able to say about your life, I have done exactly what I was supposed to do? God gave me an assignment, and I kept it, and I fulfilled it to the fullest extent it could be fulfilled. So Paul is writing from that kind of you know, like confidence, like I have done what I was put here to do. I think that's the birthright for all of us. I love the word you had about the cobwebs and the promises. Is that, you know, the enemy wants to steal your inheritance. He comes to steal and kill and destroy. So God has given you destiny and promises for your life. And, and he wants to unfold those. He wants to release those. He wants to establish you in them so that they're not just promises, they're reality. 
And, I, you know, we even sing about it, you know, all, all of God's promises are yes and amen. That means his intention is for them to come to pass. And not just to be something out there in the future, but something you're actually living in and can say, hey, this is the fulfillment of what, and I'm telling you, you can do that. <laughs> I still laugh, guys. <laughs> um, you can do that. You can live in that reality. Now, some people have given up on the possibility that this stuff can really happen. I'm telling you, you can live in the fulfillment of God's promises in your life. All right, so Paul is writing from that perspective. Um, and I've, I felt like it was really important for me just to go over a couple of things about what was the message he preached? What did it mean to fully preach the gospel? Okay, y'all with me there? What did it mean? What was Paul saying? Okay, if you read some of the other writings that Paul, you know, um, wrote, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.4, I want you to turn there, because that is not what most American Christians think. It's not, it doesn't mean what they think it means. Matter of fact, it means pretty much the opposite of what some Christians think it means. Uh, he said, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So the essence, the, 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 the irreducible essence of the message was Jesus Christ, him crucified. Right? But look what else it says. And I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. But in demonstrations of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men. But where? In the power of God. So Paul was preaching a gospel that included encounter. And with that's what he says. He said, I didn't want you to build this on human wisdom and understanding. I want this to be built on you having an experience with God's power. And that becomes the foundation that God wants to build. So the message he was saying was fundamentally, you're preaching Jesus. No question about that, right? Every Christian church in America. Every Christian church in America, every real Christian church in America is <laughs> preaching Jesus. There is no other name under heaven by which men will be saved. There is only one way, and it is Jesus. There's only one foundation that any man can lay, and that is Jesus Christ, okay? Just to be clear, because there's some confusion in some places about that. It is Jesus and Jesus only. <laughs> I'm a little narrow about that. You can get there some other way if you think it'll work, but I can just tell you ahead of time, it ain't going to work. All roads do not end up in the same place, okay? Uh, so anyway, Jesus is the message. But Paul said in wrapping, wrapping that message in its package, a part of the package has to be the demonstrations of the spirit and, the, and power so that people have real encounters with the reality of God and the reality of Jesus and the reality of the message, not just the message. Now, why is that? Because he wanted this to be real. He wants it to be real for you. He wants it to be real for the people that you share it with. Many, many, many years ago, I was at a conference where they were teaching us soul winning techniques. And it was a brand new concept at the time. And we were a prototype program they were introducing in the denomination I was a part of. And in this meeting, they pulled out a manual on training people to be soul winners. I mean, you've heard that term. It's their school of evangelism. And so in this manual, you know, we're going through procedures, and the first thing he said, well, you need to knock on X number of doors because it's statistically proven that with X number of contacts, you will have X number of responses. Uh -huh. And then he said... Everything in this manual, this manual I'm presenting to you, it, it was an insurance sales manual. We did, everywhere it talked about insurance, we just changed it to Jesus. And so their method of evangelism was um, 
statistical analysis, and if you, if you pr give any presentation, sales presentation, to X number of people, a certain percentage of them are going to say yes. If you're selling BBs, if you're selling popsicles, it doesn't matter. If you knock on X number of doors, X number of people are going to be persuadable, and they will say yes to whatever you're selling. So you just increase the number of doors if you want to increase the number of contacts. I mean, the number of converts. Is this making sense to any of you, what I'm talking about? Okay. I'm talking about this is major denominations. This is the way you're taught to do evangelism. So if you want to grow a church, if you want to see people baptized, then you just get out and knock on a lot of doors, and you talk to a lot of people, and, you know, 2%, 1%, whatever it is, they're going to say yes, and they're going to come to your church, and they're going to get baptized. And amazing thing, statistically, it works. Because a certain number of people will say yes to anything. But they don't know what they're saying yes to. That's my whole point in this, is that they're just saying yes to some concept or some idea you're giving or some hope that you might be holding out for them that are not really encountering Jesus. Now, the amazing thing about that is some people do get saved. Why? Because the name of Jesus works. Some people do get saved with that methodology. But here's my concern. We wonder why the American church is powerless. Do you ever wonder why the American church is so powerless? It's because most people get into church based on some form of what I just described. Somebody convinced you intellectually or somebody talked you into something or somebody guilted you into something and you made an intellectual decision or an emotional decision, but you did not have a real encounter with the Holy Spirit. And so the transformational element is not there. You may make some changes. You may make some behaviors to your modif uh, You may modify some of your behaviors. But the transformation of mind, body, soul, and spirit just doesn't happen because you haven't had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And so Paul says the foundation of the faith is this, the message and the encounter with the Holy Spirit. And it's not just for you personally, for the church. <laughs> All right. I'm, going, I'm teaching this morning. I'm, I'm not doing what I like to do when I travel. I usually you just say, God, come and watch people fall on the floor. That's my favorite thing to do. But I, f I feel like today I really need to say some things because I've traveled a long way and I'm only going to be here today, you know. But um, and some of the stuff, you you've probably fallen on the floor before, but some of the things I'm saying to you today you may not have heard before, uh, or at least the way I'm saying it. Um, if you're going to have a strong foundation, biblical foundation, it has to be built on encounter. Um, and so... His, it, it, it's, the church itself was meant to be established. Uh, oh, turn to Colossians. We'll read, we'll read this um, other verse that I wanted to read. Uh, da, 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 da. I got it on my phone. I got passages of scripture everywhere. Galatians. I said Colossians. I meant Galatians. Galatians 1. This is Paul again, and he's saying, um, verse 10, Galatians 1.10. He says, now, am I trying to win the favor of men or of God? Do I seek to please men? If I were still seeking popularity with men, I should not be a bondservant of Christ. Now, verse 11, this is what I want you to really see. For I want you to know, brethren, that the gospel which was proclaimed and made known by me is not man's gospel. Not a human invention according to the pattern or after man's standard. For indeed, I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came to me through direct revelation given by Jesus Christ. It came to me by direct revelation given by Jesus Christ. How many of you all remember the story of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus? By the way, as I pointed out last night, there was no horse. Everybody thinks there was a horse. There was no horse. Look it up. If you thought there was a horse, he's not there. He disappeared. The horse was not there. <laughs> Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I've always heard that, that Paul was riding a horse. He got knocked off his horse. It doesn't say that in the Bible. No, not anywhere. No horse in the Bible. Um, but he, did, he was knocked to the ground. Paul was walking, apparently. It doesn't say a horse. Maybe there was a horse, but it doesn't say. But he was just on the road, <laughs> and he got knocked to the ground. And in that encounter, in that experience, Jesus appeared to him. Jesus began the in exchange that went on you know, for a day or two after that, where he starts getting this download by, by Jesus himself 
about who he is and what, his dest what Paul's destiny is. Now, not everybody has that same degree of experience, but everybody's relationship has to come out of that same fountain. If you're going to be established in your purpose on the earth, if you're going to be established as a church, if you're going to be established in ministry, then you have to come out of that place of revelation. I'm not talking about the book of the Bible. I'm talking about the revelatory flow, all right? Because that is the foundation on which he builds. Why is apostles and prophets, why are they the foundational gifts in the, in the church? Because that's where the word comes from. Revelation's coming from the apostolic and the prophetic. That's what the church of Jesus Christ is built on. And you being a, an effective part of that body means that you're experiencing the same flow in your life. Y'all are really, everybody's agreeing with me. That's really good. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I just want to say that the message that he's talking about, that he fully preached, and here's what it was. It was the gospel of the kingdom, but the kingdom is about the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is where? Within you, all right? Where does that happen? The Holy Spirit comes and lives within you. Uh, it's a gospel of grace, right? But <laughs> that comes by a revelation of the Spirit. It's a gospel of the Holy Spirit. If you read in Corinthians, it, it even calls it the gospel of glory there in Corinthians. But it is imparted by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. You don't get an understanding of this without having that kind of continuing flow of encounter in your life. Does that make sense? Now, the reason I'm saying that is because most churches today, most of American Christianity is built on human logic and wisdom, techniques and methods uh, of church growth and success, organizational stuff. And the primary foundation for the church is not an organizational structure. It's not approval from a certain headquarters. That's not what makes it happen. What makes it happen is that you're operating out of the flow of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Hey, you guys are going to do all right then. <laughs> all right. Um, so two elements. First of all, he preached the whole message, and he preached it to everyone he was assigned to preach it to. He gave an accurate representation of what the message was. You don't need to try to go preach Jesus if you're not baptized in the Holy Ghost. Jesus himself said, go in Jerusalem and wait. You know, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation. But he said, before you do that, don't go. I mean, I'm kind of paraphrasing. <laughs> don't you dare go out until you've been endued with power from on high. Until you get the power download, don't try to go out and preach the message. Because the message isn't really the message without the power. Now, that's not, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a doctrine. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a, an experience. You have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and he baptizes you with his presence. And he's inside you, and he's outside you. He's on you. He's in you. I still am a Baptist. <laughs> he immerses you in his presence, okay? Forget, all you Methodists, forgive me, all right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's inside now. It's like if, you, if you're washing dishes in the sink over there, you are literally, if you take a, a coffee cup and you're washing it, you are baptizing that coffee cup. Because in the Greek, that's what it means. It means to be immersed. And it means that the water is inside of you and it's around you. Like the cup, you know, it's inside and it's on you. So the baptism is the whole package. It's like, whoop, you get the deal. And that's transformative. It changed Peter. Peter was never the same after that. Peter was apologetic. He was a coward in some ways. He ran from the call. Everything was going the other way. Jesus pulled him out of the mess and said, now you go sit in this room until you've got what you need to do what I've called you to do. And so him and 120 other people go and sat in the room until they got what they needed, and then they launched out in the world and changed the world. And so we may have a real vision from God. We may have a real direction from the Lord that's accurate and true, but until we get the power, you're not ever going to see that realized to the full extent make sense okay so where was i oh revelation so that all comes from revelation um so paul preached to everyone he was assigned to preach to okay so that was on several levels okay it was regional it was also the sphere of influence it was also a people group it was all those things it can you know when god gives you an assignment it can be multiple layers right so he had a multiple-layered assignment. When it says Gentiles, 
he wasn't just saying, you know, like this particular group of people. He was talking about where they lived and what they did. And he was talking about the sphere of influence that he operated in. So God is calling you out to preach the full message where you are, every one of us. He didn't give that commission to just the apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers. He gave it to all of us, right? And so we've been commissioned to go into the earth and preach the gospel. What gospel? The one Paul's talking about here, what I'm talking about. To preach that message in the power of the Holy Spirit in every place he assigns you to preach that. And so if it's at work, then you live it there. If it's in your career, if it's in your job, if it's in your family life, what, whatever assignment you're giving, your people group, your sphere of influence, your family, your assignment is to fully preach the message of the kingdom in that environment. <laughs> and then you get to do all the other fun stuff along with it. You get to have kids and family and go to Astros games and all the other stuff, you know. <laughs> But what you're doing is you're carrying this kingdom message with you into that world, and you're seeing people transformed as a result of that. Okay. To everyone assigned. Um, years, several years ago, I was in Thailand, um, and we were doing a meeting in a, a, a city that's considered like the... Um, Worst place in Thailand you can go. All the movies, all the stuff you hear about Thailand happens on that street in that town. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like going to Bourbon Street in New Orleans. You know, it's like Thailand's a great place to go. It's a great place to visit, but you hear all these stories, you see the movies, you know, like getting tattoos on your forehead and all that, you know, and how bad it is. Well, there are parts of Thailand that are like that, and there are other parts of Thailand that are just really cool, and the people are great, and you have a great time, and you're safe and secure. But there's a place called Pattaya that was established by the U.S. military <laughs> during Vietnam is a place for uh, the troops to all go and do R&R, &R, and it became just a cesspool. I mean, I, I don't know how else to say it. And so now you will literally get accosted by prostitutes as you walk down the street in the middle of the day. And when I say accosted, I mean they will come out of the bars and try to grab you and take you in. <laughs> Y'all aren't laughing. It was funny when I was there because <laughs> Rob and all the group would surround me just so, <laughs> you know, because you're walking down the street and they just, you know, they're, it's pretty serious stuff. So God sent us to that city, and we did this big outdoor meeting uh, through a friend of ours who, was, who set it up in a mall. We were like in the courtyard of a mall, and they were having concerts and music and all this stuff. Well, one of the songs that the groups kept singing was, uh, He's the God of this city. Have you ever heard that song? He's the God of this city. He's the God of this nation. He's still got a purpose for this city. Well, then they told me the story about that song. I mean, it's been really popular in the U.S. for a number of years. It's a great song. We sing it in Graham. He's the God of this city. I found out it was written in Patia. That's where that song was written. The group, I forgot the name of the group, one of the, you know, touring Christian groups was, or they were in one of the uh, restaurants or clubs or whatever it was one night, late at night, and just seeing all that stuff that's going on around them, and it's really bad, y'all. It really is. And they wrote that song, He's the God of this city. <laughs> Now, you talk about a declaration of faith, and probably one of the worst places on earth as far as morality and, you know, overt evil. There's, there, God gives them a song, he's the God of this city. How much more Houston, Texas? How much more where you live and where you work and your children? Yeah, sure, there's a lot of bad things going on. There's a lot of bad things going on in the United States. There's a lot of bad things going on all over the world. But he's the God of this city. And your assignment is this city, your people group, your region, your location is Houston, Texas. And some of you, you know, I celebrate the diversity of the body of Christ. It just blows me away. Because I'm a white guy. I'm a real white guy. I'm nothing but a white guy. I mean, I'm as white as they get. But, I mean, I can't find anybody in my tree that's not white, you know. I keep looking. I mean, there's one Indian. But everybody in Texas has an Indian somewhere, right? But, but I mean, I'm white bread, okay. But, but... In my heart, that's not who I am because I'm a kingdom, a, a, a citizen of the kingdom. And the kingdom is so diverse and multi-ethnic doesn't even begin to describe how diverse the kingdom of God is. And the world has literally come to the United States. And no, but there's no city in America that exemplifies that more than Houston, Texas. Um, yeah, my 7-Eleven store is not a 7-Eleven anymore. It's a constant uh, Conceria, how do you say that? Yeah, Conceria, yeah. Which I love, by the way. I can celebrate every culture through their food. I have discovered, I discovered the key to, 
yeah, I have discovered the key to culture, you know, like, I love Thai food, I love, you know. Um, anyway, sorry. Where was I going? So God has literally brought the nations to this nation. And if you want to touch the nations, you can start right here. And this group is a, a prime example of that. I mean, I don't have to say that to you guys, except to say you are touching the nations. When you touch your families, when you touch your friends and your coworkers, you are literally touching the nations with the kingdom gospel. Hmm, okay, I can tell you all are excited about that. Okay, so here, here's what I want to close with. And then I want to share it with Mo because I can tell when Mo gets, gets on his knees there, he's ready to go. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I got the word the other day about being empowered and just three quick things. Um, is that God wants you to live an empowered life and preach an empowered gospel and be an empowered people. You shall receive what? Power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He wants to empower you personally. He wants to empower um, the message that you're bringing so that it's not just words. It actually carries authority and dynamos, dynamite power with it, life-changing power. And he wants to empower you as a people. Now, you guys already have amazing healing miracle testimonies in this house. That just needs to grow and continue. God just wants to expand that beyond your imagination. And it's not just going to be through Jonathan that that happens. All right, he's the imparter. He's going to lead you in that. But God wants to release all of us in miracle work. He said, those who believe shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. How many of y'all believe? How many of y'all are believers? <laughs> That's you. So those who believe, well, you're going to, you're, and, and that ministry works better out there than it does in here. All right. He wants to empower the message. He wants to give authority so that you're not just speaking some, you know, memorized stuff that you're just reciting. You're actually speaking into the lives of people. You don't have to present the whole thing every time. Did you know that? The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Most of the time when I give an altar call for salvation, the prayer I lead people into is this. Say Jesus. <laughs> Say it again. Say it one more time. By the third time, the tears are starting to fall because they're already having an encounter just calling out his name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Because it's him that's saving him, not you. It's his power. It's not your convincing argument. It's the need in their life that meets the provision of God. You just love people and it happens. Okay. So you guys are going to be an evangelistic group of people. You're either going to do that or you're going to die. <laughs> Encouraging word here. You're either going to do that or you're just going to come, become another religious group that goes down the tubes. <laughs> I like to encourage people with words like that. Um, <laughs> oh, it's, it, it is true, though. It really is. Okay. I think that's it. Hmm. <laughs> Mo's got a secret weapon. I, I've been just waiting to release him with a secret yeah. weapon. What's that? He <laughs> just laughed. <laughs> Um, how many of you, uh, I know that the Ackles, how many of you experienced revival, you know, like a real move of God uh, with manifestations of the Holy Spirit, you know, where the Holy Spirit falls and things happen? Yeah. Not just people say, oh, that was nice, but I mean like slobber and snot and fall out on the floor and yeah. laughing. And well, Do you all know why God does that? First of all, he wants to make it real for people. But also God is after transformation, not just change. And we are transformed into the image we behold by the work of the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus, things happen. So I'm, I won't be surprised if some of you have some encounters today at some point in this meeting. Last night, you know, I, how's your tooth today? Is it still? I was telling a tooth story. They asked me about gold teeth last night. I realized that people who know me don't really know me. I wrote a book about all this stuff, and I kind of assumed that people know everything, but they, don't, they didn't even know about the gold teeth thing. <laughs> And, and so I'm telling him, and, and so he has a, a tooth thing happening last night for him. Um, it's not important that you know me or all that, but what I'm saying is that some stuff could happen today. Yeah, um, real stuff. So, hallelujah. Mo, why don't you come? Why don't you share? <laughs> I could tell. Everybody welcome Mo. This is Mo Sanders from Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> I was going to say, don't applaud, just throw money. Uh, 
Hmm. Just letting the ghost come on me. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. And he loves you. I think sometimes folks have a little trouble believing that. But God loves you. And the fact is, his love is passionate. Uh, Zephaniah talks about when he says, when he thinks about you, thinks about us, he leaps up and he starts dancing wildly and singing over us. And most of us, you know, are, have got a lot of that uh, European thing where you very staid and emotionless and you think if you could endure these waves of emotion that somehow you're improved but the fact is God's really breaking down those walls because he wants you to receive his love his love is transformative and his presence is transformative because he uh, he wants to get rid of all the masks that we wear all the things that we hide about all the wi the walls we've built to protect ourselves because of the fear we have. And God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And for some reason, we resist receiving those things. And the enemy's pretty much convinced us that there are things to be feared in God. And what's the first thing the angels say when they appear to men? Fear not. Don't be scared. Um, I really uh, like to talk about destiny. Every one of us has a destiny in God. And I want to start with this little story that comes out of the book of Acts chapter 10. Peter is hanging out on his roof, sunning, and he has this trance. And he sees this napkin or sheet come down out of heaven, and it's got all kinds of animals on there that are ceremonially, ceremonially unclean for Jews to eat. And the Spirit of God says, slay and eat. Now, I'm speaking King James because that's how I re read my Bible, and I'm pretty much uh, ruined by it. <laughs> but um, he says, slay and eat. And Peter says, not so, Lord. I've never touched those nasty things. I'm, I... And so three times he sees the same vision, the sheet coming down, dirty animals on it, and Peter refusing to kill them. And so finally God says to him, don't call unclean that which I have cleansed. And so the Lord kind of brought me back to that recently. And what he said was, don't disqualify them that I have qualified. And what we need to know is that when we receive Christ, he comes into us. He is the Holy One, and that's why we can be holy, because he's holy, right? And sometimes we forget it. We keep looking at our dirt in the mirror and thinking that's us, right? And that's not us. This is our carton. That's what Milton Green used to call it. He said, this is our carton. This is not really the true representation of us. This is what we walk around in, but it's not really us. And the person that is us is anointed to carry God's presence in the world. God's presence. <laughs> God's presence. <laughs> the you know, the creator of the universe, yeah. Yeah. that guy, your, your daddy, yeah. you know, you are like him. He reproduces after his own kind. <laughs> As he is, so are we in this world, right? So what's it take to get us acting like who we are, Right? You know, there's a woman that came up to, uh, I think it was Paul Yongi Cho, and she, he says, what's the problem? She says, I have an inferior, inferiority complex. He said, are you born again? She said, no. He says, then you're inferior. 
It's not a complex. You are inferior. <laughs> this is what the truth is. You, the Bible says we're a new creation, and that means we're a form of life that never lived on the face of this earth before. You are different. You can't see it, but people who don't have Christ see it. And sometimes they like it and sometimes they don't. But God, that's not your problem. As many as are willing to receive him, those he gives the power to become sons of God. Mm. I'm older than Larry. <laughs> but this is what I know, is that God uses imperfect people. He uses people who are broken. He heals and restores. But sometimes he doesn't. And this is why. Paul talks about uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, uh, you know, I was caught up into the third heaven and I saw things that it's not, it's not lawful for man to speak. And he said, because of the abundance of this revelation that the enemy, Satan, sent a spirit to assail him. And he tried three times to get this thing off of him. Now, I don't know if, how many of you have ever battled spirits, but let me tell you, it's, it's not fun. They will flat wear you out. And so Paul was looking for some relief. He's, he's pretty much comes to Jesus and he said, I've done everything I can and I can't get this thing off of me. Help. And Jesus said, um, my, uh, your strength is made, uh, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I need you to be weak because this is something you can't do in your power. The spirit has to work through you. Most of us hate the idea of being weak because we're afraid. Folks will take advantage of me. Bullies will pick on me. But God says, I, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Whenever you go, he's with you. I'm afraid he won't show up. I'm afraid he won't do it. I won't, he won't take care of me. And that's the reason a lot of us get shut down and unable to function in the power of God. I want to tell you, I've got a, I've got a message for this group. And that group, that message is, this group is a log jam. <laughs> Can you hear that? Everybody is in a stream heading in a direction, but we're like a confluence of several rivers, and we're jammed up. Okay? Not moving. Not getting there. Not becoming everything that God wants us to, to do. And so, let me tell you, the way God uses me is I'm a sledgehammer. I bust this stuff up. You know, you have a log jam in a, in a river, they put dynamite in there. Right? Well, the Holy Spirit's dunamis, like dynamite. He's going to move you guys along so that you can become everything he envisioned you to be. It's not scary. It's just enabling you to get where you're going, where God's leading you, where he's directing you. And the fact is that he, brought, he allowed this logjam to happen so that you will turn to him, seek his face. You say, here I am. I don't know what my next phase in life is. I don't know. I've been doing this, and I'm not getting anything out of it. I feel like I need to do. He's doing something, but I don't know what it is. Sound familiar? Yeah. Well, God's getting ready to move you. He's getting ready to get the Holy Ghost to give you guys a big old <laughs> so that you can go and be who you are. I mean, I'll tell you what. You and I, you know, I had cancer. And I'm doing pretty good. I'm in, I'm in total remission now. Still getting Kibo. But God wanted me weak so that his strength could work through me. And I'm telling you, he wants to do that for you. He's going to lead you in a way 
that you're going to see more accomplished for the kingdom than you ever imagined. And you're going to see a, a personality emerge from you that's your, the real you. And a lot of stuff you thought you were going to, you were supposed to be, is going to get sloughed off like a like dead skin. Right? I'm just telling you, God's getting you new you got new eyes to see the truth. And there's a truth that's been kind of foisted on you. It's not your truth. It's not eternal truth. It's temporal truth. Truth of this world. And God supersedes that. Eternal truth trumps natural truth all the time. Okay? I'm going to do this because I, I just can't get away from it. Jesus. Jesus, I thank you. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are new. Lord Jesus, I take authority over a spirit of fear. Came to you from the medical community, and I say that the thing that they have said over you has no power before Jesus. And Lord, I miss asking for your restoration. Heal and restore his heart. I know that's not where you, what you went in for. But I'm saying there's, there's, he's doing a heart work for you. Actually, that's where I, why I went into the doctor. Yeah, well, he's doing a heart work. Mm. I believe there's going to just be a release in you, there's a hmm. father. Father needs to love you, love on you, son. You've been kind of beat beat up, but God wants to. God, father wants to heal and restore you because He wants to love people through you. Yeah, yeah. You, you're gonna you, you're gonna experience this. The time is going to be shortened for his work because he really wants to put you to get you busy. All right. You know, he said the Bible says you have many teachers but not many fathers. And God's raising up fathers for a for a society that has run off its fathers. The fathers are defective or are they're just absent. God's going to restore men. This is going to sound a little crude, but he's going to restore your testicles. You know, your loins. Because he wants to empower men to be men, yeah. not just masculine women. Women don't like that. God don't like that. The Bible says that the head of every woman is a man. And he's going to have to be a man. And the head of every man is Christ. If you haven't got Christ, I'll tell you, it, it, it robs you of identity. Man, oh man. I'd just like to speak to you and just say that God's got such a wonderful plan for your life. And that he loves you so much. And he wants to restore you. There's a there's a there's a, a person in you that's wanting to bust out. And I'm declaring a jailbreak for you today. You're busting out. <laughs> okay? And I just see shackles falling off of you. Hmm. There's a scrap scripture in, in Isaiah. Where God speak, God starts speaking to. He, sa he says, identifies her as the captive daughter of Zion. There's a there's a spirit in the earth that promises to empower women, but it robs them. And God wants His daughters to be feminine and to be free to do that, free to be feminine. You know, without worried about getting abused and um, 
overrun. God empowers daughters. He does. He wants, what he wants is he wants families where, that are functioning correctly, where the, men, where the man is protective. I like the picture of a rose where the man is the sepal that holds the bloom and the woman is the bloom. And so he's supportive and he holds her up. He protects her and he allows her to bloom, becoming all God intends for her to be. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to talk about blooming females, but I am going to talk about females who bloom. Amen? That's his plan. I mean, it's so, it's so natural, and yet there's been such a perversion of that. Hmm. It's coming to you, Paul. I'm telling you. You're Paul, right? Well, Jesus, Jesus, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what your prayer needs to be when you come to Jesus? It's just yes. I mean come before him. You come before him. You present yourself as a living sacrifice. He just wants you to say Yes. Agree with him. He's got a plan for your life that is going to take you from where you are to a, to a different place. But he really needs you to be agreeable with him. Paul, uh, Larry was talking about pliability, being flexible. And that means when he says, go here, you go there. You say yes, okay? And instead of being intimidated, you'll just see it as an adventure. I think you have a heart of of an adventurer. And maybe you've forgotten who you are. But I see you as an adventurer. A trailblazer even. And this is what I'm thinking. Is that God's word is creative. That when he calls you as an adventurer... If you never were an adventurer before, you become one. How about that? Sounds better. (laughs) Well, I'm just saying, I believe he's going to lift you up and out. Yeah, I think think you're ready for something. I think it's going to be powerful. Um, Could I pray for your son? Um, I love praying for kids. For one reason. Would you mind coming up here and let me? I won't hurt you, I promise. The last kid I bit, got o- he got over it. He did. He survived. Of course, he lost the use of his arm, but I'm teasing, of course. Right here. Yeah. The reason I like to pray for kids wherever I go, is I want to bless your future. The world that you're coming into is going to be a hard place if you don't have Jesus with you, okay? So what I'm just going to ask him to do is to watch over you and protect you, bring people around who will stand with you and encourage you so that you don't lose heart. The word says in the last days men will faint of heart they will be faint of heart but I pray for you Lord Jesus I pray for this boy what's your name TJ is that TJ CJ okay I got a I've got a little cousin named CJ and today's his birthday well Lord I play I'm praying for CJ and I've asked Lord for a spirit of power and of might Lord, I ask you to open up the eyes of his understanding and give him wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. Lord, I just ask you to help him to be a forerunner 
that people his age will, will look to him and they'll say, there's something different about CJ. I want what CJ has. It'll give you a chance to tell them about Jesus and about what he's doing in your life. Because sometimes you can't tell by looking at a boy what kind of a man he'll be. But God always sees you from your destiny, from the point of your destiny, looking back to where you are now. I used to say that today is a day where you draw a line and you step over that line and you'll be different than you've ever been before. You'll be better in everything. And you just keep getting better, keep getting better, keep getting stronger. The Lord's going to bring you through his obstacle course. And it's going to purify your heart and strengthen your body and prepare you for the day ahead. And you'll be a champion. You can just start calling yourself champion. You just hadn't got the trophy yet. So I just bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. For the chance you get, pray for CJ and bless him. So that's God's blessing to come on him. Okay? Unless you want me to bite you. Um, no, I won't. I won't. Um, yeah. Yeah, God sees you. He knows right where you are. Yeah. Lord, I'm just asking for the power of the Holy Spirit to come blow up this log jam. These folks need to be about who they are and about their calling. So, Lord, I'm just asking the Holy Spirit to move. Move upon these folks, young and old. They've got places to go and experiences to have. Revelations of you. Hmm. In the name of Jesus. Some of you are kind of stuck. But I just want to declare to you, you are released in the name of Jesus. No power of the enemy can prosper against you. I'm going to repeat that. No weapon formed by the enemy can prosper against you. He may tell you something, but he's a liar. Jesus said there's no truth in him. Jesus is truth. He is. Some of you have been stymied by false reports. I just want to take authority over lies that have hobbled you and kept you from moving into your, into your destiny. I take authority over words spoken that contradict what God's plan is for you. Those words, are I just robbed them of their power. The Bible says that through faith we bring to naught those things that be. And we call things that be not as though they are. Some of you have been carrying a tail around. It's your past. And God says he's going to cut off those things from your past that you're dragging around like a tail. He did not create man to have a tail. I hope this is liberating, but I'm going to repeat this. That everything that happened in your life up to Christ is your history. Everything that happens to you from there forward is your destiny. Old things are passed away. Forgetting those things which are behind, I press forward. Rob, I see you. And this is what I believe the word is for you, 
is that you're still going through this transition and God's preparing you to move in several different directions, but there's some things that you have to go through to get your feet under you so you can be everything that God's calling you to be. I know sometimes you feel overwhelmed and you feel unqualified. The good news is God loves unqualified people. He qualifies them. He enables them. He empowers them. He transforms them to accomplish his will. And right now, you don't really see the person that, God's, that God sees, but you are becoming that person. He's letting you in, get, in, get into some situations so you can watch him work in the lives of men. And the answer to the question is yes. He sees you and he's working in your life. And he's breaking you, breaking you loose to be the person that he sees. Mm. I just release you to go forth and prosper in the thing that the Lord has set before you. Amen. Amen. You're free to be. You know, this is what I believe the Lord wants me to say to you, is that he gave you a wonderful imagination, and you're allowed to use it. The only warning in the scripture is about vain imaginations. But God gives us imaginations because he wants us to see beyond reality that the heaven we inherit is very different than the life that we live you believe that amen and so he wants to you to stretch your understanding because he wants you to start living life from his reality where are we spirit where are we in the spirit realm where that's good that's good he wants us to remember that we're seated at the right hand of God in Christ far above all principalities all powers all evil rulers of the dark present age and spiritual wickedness in high places now that word above is a preposition he has lifted us above that he wants us to see that from a position of looking down on it. Anybody who's ever been in the military knows if you're going to fight a foe, you want to fight him with him downhill trying to work his way up. Okay? When you see him from a position of being seated above him, he is under your feet. Under your feet. Under your feet. Right? He cannot kick your behind if he's under your feet. And we have to see, our, see our things from God's perspective. He already sees you victorious. The Bible already says it. He causes me to triumph in all things by Christ Jesus. All things. What's opposing you right now? What did God say in his word about things that oppose you? things that get in your way. He tells you to speak to them, command them to be plucked up and cast into the sea. We talked about this, didn't we, Larry? Yeah. This is a good thing. Any mountain on the face of this earth cast into the sea. There's plenty of room in the sea for any mountain <laughs> on this planet. Whatever it is that's standing between you and God's plan for you, Speak to it. Command it to be plucked up and cast into the sea. And that works for anybody who is in Christ. Right? You see, my job is just to remind you of who you are. To see yourselves in Christ. You know, you're not alone. Ever. And you are, you are not powerless. The enemy is a defeated foe. You know that Jesus stripped him of all of his weapons? All of them. 
The only weapons he has now are lies and deceit. They're effective, but they cannot prosper against you. You know, I'm talking to you, right? You know, that shield is really meant, you don't have to you to go backwards, but you to go forwards, quenching all the fiery darts of the evil one. I want you to say this out loud. In God's eyes, I'm a lioness. I kick butt. I hold my ground. I don't fail. I achieve. I'm a conqueror. That's right. Roar. I knew you would. Roar like a chicken. <laughs> but you will sometime when you get alone. You cut loose. I mean, I'm serious. You'll feel the anointing come on you. You need to know what your roar sounds like. Isn't that right? You can do it too. Anything I said to her, you can do. Right? You can do it too. God wants your imagination to increase where you ponder things beyond your reality. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? You need to see yourself like God sees you. You're, you know, you may, you know, you say, but I'm just, I'm just a meager guy. I'm just, yeah. Well, you may be in a meager position, but you'll never be a meager person. <sighs> okay. I'm going to have to explain this a little more. Jesus said, remember him? He's, the, he's truth. Truth. He said, <laughs> he's still saying, Just listening and marking my spot. Imagine. All power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go. Therefore, go therefore. I know that's kind of a gap in the, in the train of thought I was having, but um, it's essentially the message is the folks need to hear the good news. Most of them are tired of hearing church preaching because it just leaves them with a, an empty message. God wants you to tell people about him. And every one of us is a capable minister of the New Testament. That's what Galatians says. It also says, Who do I seek to please, God or man? For if I seek to please man, I can't be the servant of God. Now look, God's not looking for servants. He created angels to serve him. He created us to fellowship with him and for us to be the bearers of his presence. And Jesus really wants to lift you up out of circumstances. He is the one that says in Samuel that he is Baal Perazim, the Lord of the breakthrough. Some of you guys need a breakthrough. And it's not going to happen unless you're looking for it. He wants you to rise up and be all that he called you to be. Hmm. Yeah. I think I'm done. Yeah. I 
pull up, get the plug pulled. Good job, man. Good job. Wow. Well, this is what I'm sensing really strongly that we're to do right now together. That, that log jam word might have seemed a little odd to you at first, but I just saw that same picture because uh, to go down a river, all the logs have to be going in the same direction uh, together, you know. And uh, something I think about a lot as a, a leader of a fellowship now, the Bible talks about the unity of the spirit in the bond of love. It's not necessarily a program that's going to get everybody going in the same direction. It's not necessarily a uh, theology. It's an encounter with the Holy Spirit. He said to those 120 people, you go wait in the room, and when that happens to you, it's going to change everything. And after that point, they had the unity of the Spirit and the bond of love. They flowed together. They were a disparate group. They were going in different directions with different things going on in their lives. They were all spectrum of the culture. But when the Holy Spirit came on them, their hearts were knit together by the Spirit, and they moved forward as one. And I believe right now, I'm not going to take a long time to do this, I just believe right now God wants to drop his Holy Ghost bomb in this place to break up the log jam and get the logs headed in the right same direction um, and uh, see some amazing things happen, amazing things. Is that okay with you all? All right. So could you all just stand up? I mean, you've been sitting for quite a while, a couple of hours, actually. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mo's got a secret weapon here. Uh, uh, let me see one of them, Mo. I've been doing this at my church. I think I need to explain it to you. This is the modern version. Uh, you say, what is that? Uh, how many of you have garage door openers? So Mo gave me this thing a while back. It doesn't look like this. It was a square one. It looks kind of like a garage door opener. And he said, this is, this is how you open the windows of heaven. Just push the button, and they open. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's a cute little thing. It's kind of silly and all that. And I told one of the young men in our church about, about the age of CJ, I, I told him about it. So he grabbed it, and he starts going up and down the prayer line one day in church. He said, this thing works. And he's going around pushing the button, and it, just the windows of heaven open. The glory comes down. Y'all believe that? It's like an object lesson. It's, I mean, I know this is not the actual door opener of heaven. But, yeah, of course. But I just want to explain it first because Mo will get excited and he'll forget to tell you all that. Yeah, I'll but, tell you all that. <laughs> um, when, my, when my nephews were five years old, they were playing in the garage. And uh, I, asked, I asked them, I said, what are you doing? They said, we're building a rocket ship. You know, five-year-olds could build rocket ships in the garage. I said, well, what are you building it out of? They said, uh, wood and aluminum foil. Pretty cool, huh? So they had some nails driven in this board, and they had them bent a little bit. I think maybe they were bent when they got them. But I said, what are those for? And they said, well, that's the peculiar. That's what helps the thing go. And I thought, how wonderful it is that children have no trouble imagining that they can build a rocket ship out of wood, aluminum foil, and that a few nails driven into a board is their computer, and they can go anywhere they want to. You know, God's created a big universe, and he fills it, the Bible says, and we can go anywhere he is, and anywhere we go, he is. So I just want to encourage you, let your imaginations run. Some of them get a little stifled because you don't you don't remember to use them. Okay. Would, would you say imagination and faith are hand in hand? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to give one away oh, back over here. Yeah. You can give that one. Oh, I'll give them up. Oops, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. I'll I dropped the it. remote. I dropped it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is made of valuable wood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll go so far as to say this, is that revelation, yeah, imagination fueled by revelation, is, is like the place where God works in us. That's the renewing of the mind. That whole renewing of the mind is seeing it through his eyes. It's creative. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Uh, here's what I want to do while Mo's handing out his garage door opener. How many of y'all believe the heaven the door's already, I already pushed the button. It's already open. It's open. Okay. And um, so I'm just going to pray. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come. 
I can't make the Holy Spirit come because he's already come. But what you can do is you can receive what he's already pouring out here today. He's just looking for receivers, 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 receivers. All right, so just lift up your hands. <laughs> uh, you don't have to lift them up, by the way. That's not required, but it seems to be effective. It's like getting your antenna up, you know, okay? So just say this with me, Father, I want it all. <laughs> I want your power. I want your glory, your purpose, your destiny fulfilled. I want you to take me where you want me to go. Holy Spirit, <laughs> come right now. Baptize me. Fill me. Lord, I am yours. Hallelujah. Now just receive what you just asked for. Just wait on the Lord right now. Just Now the Bible says he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He spoke King James English. Receive the Holy Ghost. Right now, just receive what you've asked for. fire fall. Let your glory come down. Mm. Mm. Now if you're standing close enough to somebody to do this, just push your hand on their shoulder right now. Just a point of contact. Just release. Father, I release. Just say that with me. Father, I release what you put in me to put the people I'm touching, to put in the people I'm touching right now. Holy Spirit. Fill in Jesus' name. <laughs> Is there anyone who came in with physical pain this morning? Wow, well, okay, there's three, eight, four, five. All right, would you guys check your pain level out right now and tell me, is it better, the same, or worse? Olivia said, yours is better? What was it, your back? How much better is it? Wow, that's pretty cool. All right, now what's your name? Could you put your hand on her shoulder? Say, in Jesus' name, all pain, go now. All right. <laughs> now check it out, Olivia. No pain. <laughs> Yay, God. Hallelujah. All right, who else had pain? Raise your hand. What was yours? Yeah, elbow still hurting. How's it feel right now? Still bad. Okay, this is a tough one. So, I'm no, just kidding. Jonathan, why don't you grab his elbow there? Just tell, in Jesus' name. Pain. Leave now. I just hear the Lord saying that injury is healed in Jesus' name. Injury is healed in Jesus' name. Give it a second or two. <laughs> I'm going to come back to you. Just give us, and keep working it like that. You know, do, do your elbow or something. Just keep, because I think God's doing them. There's a work of healing sometimes. God does a work of healing. So, all right, who else had a pain? You did. Where, where's yours? Okay, how's it feel now? Uh huh. <laughs> wow, 90%? Hallelujah. Is this your wife? Or just a good friend. No, uh, put, put, your, uh, put your hand on his knee. You're allowed to do that. <laughs> you say, right now, in Jesus' name, this knee is 100% better. Hallelujah. Now move it around there, buddy. See how it feels. Are you, you mean 95 now? Or? Yeah. 95 is good. Everybody say, 95 is good. I know you guys have already heard this, but I just have to repeat it every time. The reason I do that, I learned it from other men who do it, but uh, we have a tendency if somebody's not completely healed to say, oh, well, God didn't do anything. But if they're 90% better, he did something. And so by declaring that, that allows faith to
Hypersense coming. Maybe before you leave here. Okay, so that's important for me to tell people why that's happening. Any change yet? Still the same? Yeah, I told you it was hard. It's tough. Yeah, you're. <laughs> all healing is impossible humanly, right? I mean, that doesn't happen. But God, with, all, with God, all things are possible. There is no hard healing in, in miraculous healing. Um, so it's got, something's going to happen there in a minute. Sue, did you, were you raising your hand or were you just having a Holy Ghost fit back there? <laughs> <laughs> Those are okay, by the way. <laughs> it's hurting a little bit? Yeah. Any better? Yet? Come on, Lord, in Jesus' name, no pain. All pain go now, all hip pain. And the cause of the hip pain, whatever uh, in the muscles or in the, whatever's in the uh, uh, nerves there, in the name of Jesus, line up with the word of God and no more pain, no more pain. Perfect movement, function, restored. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. I kind of laid my hand this, this man back, but uh, uh, what I think is that there's a lot of folks who are getting raised up. Okay. God's raising them up because he wants them to be able to see farther. Okay. Thank you, Lord. I kind of see a dove. And the thing about a dove is a dove flies high and he has extended fish his eyes so forward. I'm believing you're going to get to see more than you ever imagined. Amen. Spiritual stuff. Amen. Praise God. Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> What's your name? Does anybody else have physical pain? Go ahead. Jonathan. Put your, there you go. Free. 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 Right now. No more no more tightness. No more tension in the muscles. Complete freedom of movement with no pain in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Okay, move it around a little bit, Jonathan, and check it out. What, what was your name? Casey. Casey, let me see that. <laughs> this injury is repaired in Jesus' name. The muscles, the bone, the tendons, in Jesus' name. And I think the enemy's kind of been beating you up a little bit, too, think, like making you feel really dumb <laughs> for, for being injured, okay? And uh, that's what he likes to do is make us feel like we're responsible for stuff like that. Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you that it is your blood, your stripes, that bought our healing. It's not how smart we were or how well we did things, but it's by your stripes that we're healed. So, Father, right now, just release this elbow in the name of Jesus to function normally without pain and all injury to be completely repaired. Repaired. If I feel warmth right there. There's, I mean, I'm not just saying that. I really feel like a physical heat. In your elbow, something's happening. Something's happening. Yeah, cool. Cool. 80% on your back? Yeah. What's wrong? You didn't get 100%, Olivia. <laughs> no, put your hand back. We keep doing it. Keep going. No, 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 stop. Jesus. So when you were praying for me, I was just sitting here going, I would love it. I would love it. I'd Yeah. Oh, well, praise God. Okay, 100%, 100%, 100%. 100 all pain gone, no restriction of movement, all tension relieved and released in Jesus' name. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory. Now, healing is two things in my understanding, okay? Number one, it's just that God is good and it's part of his gift to us that he likes to heal people. Just because you're his children, you have an inheritance in healing, all right? It also is a sign and a wonder or a miracle to demonstrate to others his goodness. It's like, oh, hey, God's here and he's doing stuff. Jesus, everywhere he preached, he healed the sick. Everywhere he preached the gospel, he healed the sick. And it was a, it was a duel. It was 
First of all, because he loves people and he wants to give it well, but it's also a demonstration of his authority and power to confirm the word that he was preaching. So how's your back now? 95. What is this 5% thing? Like, Lord, we want 100%. 100%. It's completely healed. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. All right. Well, I don't know what else to do today except how many of you feel like God's spoken something specifically on purpose to you today? It was for you. Everybody? Anybody? <laughs> Everybody? Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, Sometimes there's just these dramatic explosion demonstrations and sometimes it's kind of quiet like it is right now. But I do sense that God is aligning, aligning you with his purpose individually. And as he's aligning you with his purpose individually, that's lining you up together corporately. And, um, you know, anytime there's a new work or a new thing God's doing, there's always like question marks and where's it going and where's it headed. As you stay in the river, as you stay in the river, Ray, <laughs> as you stay in the river, <laughs> that river will take you where you're going. You don't have to worry about figuring out your path. If you stay in the river, it will take you where you're going, okay? So the issue is stay in the river together, and you will go where he's taking you to go. How many of y'all love Jonathan and Olivia? Y'all like these guys? Could, could you guys come up here? I want to pray over y'all. <laughs> yeah, like, how many of y'all like? Oh no, 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 you wouldn't be here if you didn't love them. I know that. You wouldn't be here if you didn't trust them. Um, I know that. You know, and and so it doesn't hurt to tell them that sometimes. By the way, it encourages folks to hear that. Uh, whew, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Would y'all just extend your hands toward these guys? Father, you said that uh, you would strengthen the hands that hang down. You would strengthen the weak knees. You would cause Jonathan and Olivia to mount up with wings like eagles' wings to soar. So, Father, I'm asking you right now to renew that work of your spirit in them. Cause that fresh fountain to bubble up inside of them that causes them to rise above what Mo said, rise above to raise you up above circumstances, above obstacles, above situations, that you're fighting from higher ground, and you see nothing, nothing impeding you. What I mean is no matter how big the mountain is, I just want to repeat what Mo said, the ocean is big enough to handle it. The sea is big enough to handle whatever mountain you're facing. And so just speak to the mountain and let it be cast into the sea and let Jesus be glorified. By that mountain being cast in the sea, Jesus is going to be glorified. Whew. Hallelujah. Wow, wow, wow. Whew. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you that you call this couple to this work and this season in their life. And, Lord, we just pray that it prosper in every way. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Yeah, I've got a word for y'all. Every one of you knows somebody that could benefit by being here. Now, that's not to put something on you. It's to be the truth. That every one of you knows someone who could benefit by being here. I want to encourage you to grab that person and bring them here. Because they're going to encounter God. They're going to encounter Jesus. And it's going to bring about some changes that you couldn't bring about by yourself. But just getting them in that environment. Just getting them in that place where they're loved, but where the power of God is also. That's going to bring some of the changes you've been hoping to see in their lives. So if you've got a... How many of you have friends? You know, i got a friend. <laughs> no, seriously, if you got somebody, you know, you've been praying for, her, just grab them and get them here. Grab them and get them here. And if you can't get them here, just get God to them. Yeah, but I think some people are really going to be released just getting them in this room. <sighs> glory, glory. I just see a season of signs and wonders, uh, Jonathan, that you've, what you've seen, God's going to multiply. Wow, what you've seen, God's going to multiply. Let me speak to one last thing, and I'm going, to, I'm going to quit. But this is really important for some of you. Financial, how many of you are facing financial issues? Don't raise your hands. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to depress anybody by the number of hands. If you're facing financial issues, I know Rob taught a lot about this. He told me he did when he was here. But let me just say something. I don't know if he said this or not. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I need to say it today. God has a miraculous plan of economy. Okay? 
It's miraculous. The kingdom economy is a miraculous plan. Now, we operate in the world system. We have jobs. We do stuff in the world. But when we uh, engage in God's economic plan, it is miraculous. That means that what you can't do, he can do. What's impossible with men is possible with God. Things that would not normally happen will happen. His system is is uh, miraculous. Uh, and one of the words over our house and Graham, a uh, team from Bethel came a couple of years ago and prophesied over Graham, Texas, our, the house that I lead, that we were going to be the miracle capital of Texas. That blew me away. I didn't know what, I still don't know what to do with that word. It's like, what, what do you do with that, you know? But here's what I do know, that God is releasing miracles in healing. He's releasing miracles in finances. He's releasing miracles in relationships, okay? And God wants to release that in the financial realm for you today. But there is a buy-in. Does everybody know what a buy-in is? Either you play poker or you have investments. Either one. you, you got a buy-in. you got to put something on the table to get something back, right? The buy-in for the miracle kingdom is simply giving. That's the buy-in. It's not an amount even. It's, it's that you give what the Holy Spirit tells you to give. And when he releases that, there is an exponential return that's beyond what you put in for the buy-in. That's what makes it miraculous. You, you sow seeds, right? And those seeds multiply into big trees. What I'm saying is if you're finance, financially in a log jam right now, things aren't moving for you, if, just give. And I don't, I don't want you to give to me. Give to Rob. Give to these guys. Don't give it to me. But just see what that seed does. If you release that in faith, just giving, you'll see the whole thing turn around. I mean, it may not be overnight, but you will begin to see movement in that realm. And it'll be miraculous. It's not just what would normally happen in the circumstances. You will recognize it's God's hand directly involved in your finances. Is everybody cool with that? So, so somewhere. All right. Hallelujah. All right, brother. Thank All you, right. man. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. You know, it's interesting about the sowing. When, when y'all sowed into us, we, Olivia and I, we pray about it every month. And we sow into people and ministries all over the world. So none, we don't take a penny right now at all. So all the money that goes into God Manifest goes back out. Um, it goes to our guest speakers. Uh, the, the guest speakers that come here, they don't, they don't ask for an amount. They don't even ask for a love offering. We, we bless them. And I, I believe that's the, part, that's, the, that's the beauty of the, beauty of the kingdom of heaven. You know, we, we take care of one another. And, and, but we're always, so your, your finances are sowed into world ministries. So just wanted y'all to know that. Y'all, y'all love them. They're amazing. Well, thank y'all very much. Um, are y'all up here for a quick Q&A? We can do Q&A. Okay. Well, we're going to log off right now. Olivia can log us off. And then we're going to do a quick Q&A with these two. Um, feel free.